Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. And today we have with us L.M. Stamper, who's the Managing Director with Evermore Wealth. And today we're going to be talking about how women can grow money tax free. Stamp, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Mike. How are you doing today? Hey, doing great. And I love this topic because um, I think the word tax-free is kind of like a little ding for people to say, hold up. Uh, That's something I don't hear a whole lot. And growing money um, is wonderful, but tax-free, tell me more about that. So let's just jump right into your work with helping women growing their money, um, number one. And then number two, how does tax-free factor in? Yeah. Yeah. So um as far as you know, the, the our practice and who we work with, you know, we primarily look, work with uh, you know women over forty. Uh, you know, professionals usually C suite women. Uh, we do a lot of work with women in the sports industry as well. Uh, and from a growth perspective, obviously tax free is like you said, it kind of perks your ears up. Now that doesn't mean that you should never have things that are uh, tax deferred or you know maybe taxable on an annual basis because there are some deductions that you get. So it's actually kind of useful sometimes to have some tax uh, some tax vehicles that way you can uh, use your deduction. But that said, once you get past that, most people start to look at saying, okay, well if, if I can have the majority of my income tax free, or or if I have enough income that's tax free, it minimizes those other things overall that are taxable. Uh, it's typically a good route to look at. Because aren't I think correct in thinking this? When you think about, um, you know, here's this box, yes or no, should I grow my income or my wealth tax free? Typically, people want to say yes because um, they think in their mind, well, taxes are at this level today. Mm-hmm. In 5, 10, 15, 20 years, when I get ready to go and look at retirement, are taxes going to be the same or less or more? And I would say, and I'm not a financial professional like you are, probably taxes are going to continue creeping on up. So wouldn't we want to not pay taxes in the future if we, if possible? Yeah, that's all things being equal, you would say, yes, I I want it to be tax free. But people have to keep in mind that usually, especially in retirement planning, when you are trying to guesstimate what taxes are going to look like in the future, a lot of that has to do with what you have now from an asset perspective and how old you are now. So to give you an example of that, if I'm working with a client and she's 63 years old and we have X amount in assets and 401ks and IRAs, we have a pretty good idea at least what her immediate uh, tax situation is going to look like because retirement's about two or three years down the road. Even with taxes, we all expect taxes to go up, but even with them going up, uh, you know, we, we can kind of get an idea of what it's going to look like maybe over the next five years or so. But if you're working with, uh, you know, uh, someone who's 41, 42, 43 years old, 50 years old, we have a pretty long runway before we get to retirement. And what we have to do as planners, is we have to look at that scenario and say, based on your current income, based on where your assets are today, and based on how much we're going to grow those assets over the next 15, 20 plus years, do we think taxes will be higher for you or lower for you? And lots of times, kind of a rule of thumb, everyone's a little different, obviously. But as a rule of thumb, if you're under, let's say, 50, 55 years old, you earn a good income, more than likely you're going to be in a higher tax environment. Why? Well, if you're 40 years old and you're earning, let's say, 100,000 a year, stands to reason you'll earn more than that when you're 50. And you'll earn more than that when you're 60, meaning you're automatically just moving into a higher tax bracket, even if they don't change the bracket. Right. So we know you're walking into a higher tax environment. And then we also look at, you know, the state of of USA, right, from the amount of debt that we have, from the fact that we're in historically low tax rates uh, overall. Again, lots of times it's case by case, but lots of times it does make sense to at least have some tax free strategies. Now, if you're not sure. Well, then hedge your bets. Do half of it tax free, half of it tax deferred. But yes. if you feel pretty confident that there's going to be a pretty big tax bill, you know, you can err on the side of caution and maybe do a 60% or 70% of your savings strategy tax free. Yeah. Keyword being a balanced strategy. Mm-hmm. So let's not do it all one way or the other, um, whatever you feel comfortable with. That's a really good point. I like that a, a whole lot because some, you know, someone might go, yeah, I follow you there, but 
but what uh, it seems like grandpa kept telling me this or it seems like I sh- you know I've read this in the news and so if that's the case have a, have a good balance so that's really good so talk a little bit about some of the ways or vehicles that this can be accomplished because again you know what if you choose to to grow some some of your wealth tax free um or tax favored uh, um what what would that look like yeah so i'll i'll leave the I'll leave the real estate and business ownership conversations kind of to the side because those are obviously different animals. Uh, but a lot of people know that there are some great, great um, tax savings and tax deductions that you get when you have your assets in real estate. Also, you can do some creative things to keep your tax liability low when you're a business owner or you have business equity. But if we're talking about the other 90% of America, uh, which is, hey, you know, we go to work and we put money away in different vehicles. I tell people try to keep things simple. It's, it's it is very simple. You are either going to use a Roth IRA, you're going to use a Roth 401k, or you're going to use a life insurance retirement plan. And that's that those are the tax-free vehicles. And there's no magic to it. There's no uh gotchas, there's no, you know, secret around the corner. Those are just the three vehicles that you can use to save for retirement that are tax-free. Now, a lot of people know Roth IRAs. Roth 401ks are becoming more popular, more and more employers are uh, allowing the employees to utilize them. But it's the life insurance and the life insurance retirement plan that that people really don't know a lot about or there's negative press around it. But those are the three. Yeah, because when I hear the word life insurance, I I don't I don't um, relate to retirement plan being, uh, you know, after that, I think of life insurance as you check the box and go, do you have life insurance? And you think of the old days term life insurance. So let me get a 20 year term, 10 year term. But then the problem with that is you got to qualify for it. And then in 10 or 20 years, requalify. And now that brings up some concerns. So let's talk about that life insurance retirement plan. What does that look like? Because that sounds sure. very good to sure, use life sure. insurance for retirement. Yeah, you absolutely can. Before I do that, I want to I want to simplify that because when people hear life insurance, like you said, they one, they only think of it as one type of insurance. And two, they lump it in with other insurances like auto insurance, homeowners, health insurance. And it's just a different, different animal. That said, people have to understand that there's three institutions that we give our money to. The three major institutions that we give our money to are banks, insurance companies, and Wall Street. I'm just kind of lumping Wall Street in as an institution. Mm -hmm. So if you talk, if you're at a dinner party, you're talking with a friend, you know, family, hey, what are you doing? Where are you putting your money? Wherever they tell you they're putting their money, it's going to be one of those institutions. It's either going to be a bank strategy, it's an insurance strategy, and or it's a Wall Street strategy. Now everyone knows the bank and the Wall Street, right? CDs, savings accounts, you know, checking accounts, those are bank strategies. Uh, 401ks, IRAs, stocks, bonds, that's Wall Street. Uh, But what people don't understand is a lot of folks utilize insurance, an insurance savings strategy, and they don't even know it. So for instance, a pension. If you work in any kind of industry that offers a pension, or in Texas, TRS, which is Teachers Retirement Service uh, Services, that's a pension. A pension is an insurance contract. Annuities are insurance contracts. So those are a way to give money to an insurance company, and they're going to grow it a specific way, and they're going to return it to you in the form of income in a specific way. But when people hear about life insurance retirement plans or the idea of that, it's either so foreign or they've never heard of it, or they hop online and you know people like you know, Dave Ramsey and these folks kind of bash it when they have it themselves, which is kind of ironic. Um, but it, I, in my experience and, and in my humble opinion, I think it flat any any kind of negative things that you hear about using life insurance for retirement is that it simply comes down to this. Mike, there is a battle for your dollar and the insurance companies want your dollar and the Wall Street companies want your dollar. And the insurance company is going to say, hey, don't put your money over into Wall Street. It's risky. You'll lose it. And the Wall Street guys say, oh, don't put your money in insurance. You know, it doesn't get a great rate of return. And that's just not the case. The case is they're both wonderful. They're both there to do what they do. And they do what they do perfectly. So every product, everything out there is there for a reason. And it does what it's supposed to do. It just comes down to, does that make sense for your plan? A life insurance retirement plan might not make sense for everyone, but it's a legitimate vehicle. Now, I'll go a little bit deeper into that, but I I wanted to preface it with people have to understand you can give your money to an insurance company for the specific purpose of retirement income, in addition to a death benefit if something happens unexpected along the way. So you said two things that I find interesting that I want to kind of put a pin in and make sure we clarify and to use your word, simplify. Death benefit versus life 
living benefit. And also when you lump in, you know, insurance with homeowners and car and all that insurance you're saying is not always an expense because it can be an asset, an investment. And when you look at what the things that the a properly structured life insurance uh, vehicle can be, it's not only what we think of as, oh, you pass away and now here comes the amount of money as a death benefit. It now transcends into what it can benefit us now as a living benefit that you can take advantage of before a death happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll dive deep into it I, before I do, though, because I don't want, I don't want entrance to dominate the, the conversation. Uh, but it sounds like it will because it's an important topic people have to understand. But again, going back to back to tax free retirement, Roth IRAs are great. They're fantastic. I love Roth IRAs. I always suggest using Roth IRAs. Roth 401ks are great. The, the difference is with a Roth IRA, there's some limitations, right? The most you can put in is 6,000 or 7,000 if you're over 50. And if you earn a certain amount of income, you can't directly contribute to a Roth. So there's limitations there. <laughs> okay. But when you put that money in there, you attach it to whatever stock or mutual fund you want. And it grows tax-free and you can pull it out tax-free and it's fantastic. And those limitations you mentioned are annual. Yes, annual. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. And then Roth 401k, doesn't matter how much you earn or don't earn it. You can put in whatever you can put in a traditional 401k. You can put in a Roth 401k. It's great too. You put the money in there, gross tax-free, you can pull it out tax-free. But even then it has a limitation of 20,500 20, currently uh, okay. per year. So those are things that I definitely love to use. I'd, I'd love to implement. And I also love to implement life insurance retirement plans when it's appropriate for the client. So let's talk about it. The magic of a life insurance retirement plan is just simply this. It's a life insurance policy that acts just like a typical policy in that it has a death benefit. And if something happens, your beneficiaries get a tax-free payout, whoever you have as the beneficiary. The difference is compared to auto or home or term life is every month that you're doing and paying your premiums into that policy, the insurance company is giving you a rate of return on the premiums. And they just redeploy that right back inside the policy in the form of what's called cash value. That's it. There's no magic to it. There's no gotcha. I think that when people, when you get online and you Google and people try to poo-poo it, they try. To, it's no different than Coca-Cola stock. I like to, and the reason I like to use that, Coca-Cola pays a dividend. So every quarter they look at their books, they look at how well they've done and they say, okay, based on the people, the owners of the stock, we're going to give you a 2.16% dividend. And you can take that dividend and put it in your pocket, or you can just redeploy it and reinvest it. That's all life insurance retirement plans do. They do the same thing. The insurance company annually looks at their books and they say, based on what we've done, Mike, you've put in $10,000 this year into this policy, and we're going to give you a dividend on that $10,000, and we're going to redeploy it in cash value. And then when you get to the end of the road, meaning retirement, at that point, you have a choice. You have all this cash value. You can start to take it out tax-free if you'd like to do it the right way, or you could just leave it there and pass it on to your heirs. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you designate it as a retirement plan, you're going to take some money out, but you're yeah. very flexible there. But the key is, Dividend, and that's and there's certain types of life insurance, obviously, that you want to use for this, but dividend paying life insurance is really not much different than dividend paying Coca Cola stock or Johnson and Johnson stock. Okay, but let's use that Coca Cola example. Let's say that Coca Cola pays that dividend one year, and let's say that at some point during the year, the market tanks and Coca Cola stock goes down, and now you look at your holdings with Coca Cola stock. And it's dramatically less than what it was two, three, four months ago. Right. Is the same volatil volatility in place and risk in with one of these um, plans that you're talking about? Properly designed plans, I would say from a compliance standpoint. <laughs> yes. Keep that in mind. No. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I say no, there's no risk because I'll, when using the right type of life insurance for these strategies, if nothing else, you get a guaranteed minimum. Okay. And that's the that's the difference between Coca-Cola stock and a life insurance yeah. retirement plan. If I if I get the right plan, I have it designed right, use the right type of company, then at a minimum, I'm going to get a guarantee every single year. And that is a contractual guarantee that's built into the contract. So the day that I sign it, the insurance company has to honor that. Now they're either going to give me that minimum or they're going to give me the dividend. You and the dividend is always higher. But to your point, if they've had a terrible year and they don't pay a dividend, they have to at least pay me the guarantee. Yep. So that's it, huge. It is. It is. 
based on, of course, the claims, you know, paying ability of the company and all that good stuff. It's risk free in that regard, just like it's risk free if you put 100,000 in Bank of America. Well, all things being equal, Bank of America is a strong company and you're, they're not going to go bankrupt. So your money's pretty much risk free. Um, but yeah, that is the difference, right? Now, yeah. we're simplifying it, but it needs to be simplified because once you get into the weeds of, of how it works and whatnot, um, it can get, it needs education. Like I, I tell people all the time when I'm working with clients, when we, if we get to the insurance conversation, I always like to dedicate its own meeting. Because I can explain a stock or a mutual fund to a client in 10 minutes. Because why? Because you've heard it your whole life. Right. Right. You wake up, you see it on TV, you see the fidelity green line, you see that these, everyone knows how it works. Oh, Amazon stock is up. Everyone knows how that works. So I don't have to have, you know, 45 minute meetings with clients. But if we're talking about intricate life insurance strategies, then yeah, it, it deserves its own, its own meeting. And it requires it because there's just not a lot of proper education out there around it. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned um, life insurance retirement plans. So as cash value and dividends and over time it grows and you can pass it along. So there's all that. What about another aspect of the living benefit that we're talking about here is what are some other things that you could do with that if you didn't want to only wait until retirement age, because that might be well down the road. What are some other things that would be a benefit while you're still living? So there's some very advanced strategies. So when we're talking about these kind, this kind of, of life insurance, we're talking about something that's been around for over 150 years. We're talking about something that's been around and that's been utilized by the very wealthy individuals in this country. So I think part of the reason why people don't know about it is it, for decades and decades, it, it was kind of, I don't want to say a secret of the rich, but it was definitely a tool of the rich. But the reality is fast forward, anyone can have one of these plans. We have clients that put $100 a month into these. We have clients that put $10,000 a month into them. It, it's all based on your cash flow and what makes sense for you. Um, but that said, what can I do along the way? The beauty of a properly designed plan, let's take somebody who is, you know, the sooner the better, let's take somebody who's 30. And they say, okay, I'm 30 and I'm ready to start my life. And I'm going to be, you know, uh, successful with my saving strategies. And they start one of these plans. From 30 to 50, they're funding it. There are so many things that they can do with the living benefits. They can use that cash value in various ways. They can just withdraw it if they want, or they can loan against it, kind of like how people loan against a 401k. They can use that money to pay for college. They can use that money to invest in real estate. They can use that money to uh, fund certain things in their life that they maybe don't want to use the bank for. Like, for instance, they want to buy a car. They can use their policy to do that. Now, in those scenarios, you're kind of, and there's a, a ton of info on that. We're not going to get into it, but you're kind of using it as your own personal bank. Yeah. And yes, you can do that. And now, depending on the individual, I have some clients that specifically have those plans for that. They have it as something that they're going to build up and utilize in the future before they get to retirement. Then I have other clients that say, look, we're just putting money in there. Every time I put money in there, I think of it as money I'm putting in my IRA or my 401k. I'm not going to touch it until I retire. But you can do both. It's extremely flexible. There's no 59 and a half rule um, that you can't touch. You don't have to get a credit check. You know, it's your money. Uh, but again, it's one, highly misunderstood. Two, definitely poo-pooed out there. But again, in my opinion, that is by people that either want to sell you just investments or they want to sell you just term insurance. Right. Uh, but most important, it's not for everybody. That's the thing. Like once you start to go, go down the list of, of these plans, they sound fantastic. Oh my gosh, it's, it's tax free. And, you know, I can, I can get it whenever I want and I can put almost unlimited money in there and it's creditor protected if I'm ever sued and I can use it as my own bank. Oh my gosh, this is great. Stamp, why doesn't everyone have it? Well, I'll tell you, in my opinion, my humble opinion, why people, not everyone has it. First and foremost, you have to qualify for it. So it's life insurance. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, if you're you're four foot two and you, and you weigh 400 pounds and you smoke and you've had a heart attack, you probably can't get one. So it's a privilege. It's not a right. You know, anyone can open up a Roth IRA. Right. It's not a right to get one of these. So that's first and foremost, you have to be approved for it. Two, it's not a short term strategy. Yes, you can get the cash, but the idea isn't to use it as an ATM and pull it out the next day. So it's really a mid to long term strategy. And three, I think you have to have some kind of steady cash flow. If, you're, if your cash flow is all over the place, you, you, you can't say, hey, I'm going to designate X amount per month or per year to this and I'm going to do it consistently. It's not for you. So I think those are deterrents, right? Yeah. And, and that's fine. That's fine. Um, 
not every investment slash savings vehicle is right for everyone. Hundred percent, and I think that's um, when when you hear someone that's in financial services say, "Well, here's all the wonderful reasons. Let's let's move forward and not balance it with what you just said." You know, that's that's being prudent and that's yeah. being uh, um, transparent. Now, someone might hear that and go, "Okay, that's a good point," but no, that's not me. And oh, that's good, but oh, that's not me either. Okay, well, maybe now that might be a part of my balance strategy. So I want to explore that. Now, am I going to divert and take everything? No. Am I going to do that as my only thing? Of course not. No. But maybe that becomes one of the pillars in my retirement you know, strategy. So I just think that it's so interesting when you hear, you know, LIRP, you know, life insurance retirement, you know, plan or strategy. It's just something where people don't think of it like that. And maybe a couple little thoughts, you know, pop into mind to say, you know, I've heard of that, but boy, this just really clearly laid out some great um, um, options. So um, when you're thinking about, um, does do any of these benefits um, work better or differently if you are uh, self-employed versus if you work for a corporation? Yeah. So that's when you get in some really advanced strategies, right? So you can set these up uh, via your business. You know, if you're a self-employed individual, you can have business owned life insurance or corporate owned life insurance. And that's really where the business and the individual, whether that's the employee or the employer, and the life insurance company have pretty much an agreement to where it's kind of a win-win-win. The, the business is, is utilizing the employee the right way, the employee is getting a benefit, the insurance company has a policy out there. So there's some very advanced strategies. Uh, and sometimes in some scenarios, the, the only strategy that makes sense is to use a type of plan like this. Now, again, those are very specific. Um, type strategies, but absolutely, I, what people don't understand is banks love life insurance. They love cash value life insurance. Just Google yep. Tier One Capital, and Tier One is the best capital that a bank has. And banks have billions and billions of cash value life insurance. Now that's and I interesting, tell folks. Yeah, the smartest people on the planet, right? Quote unquote, the banks, the banking world, the smartest people on the planet have gobs and gobs of this stuff. If they have it, maybe there's something to it. Right. Yeah. But again, it's not for everyone. It's, 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 and I think that's another issue is I think that some insurance salesmen and salespeople will just, everyone needs a policy. Everyone should have this policy. And that's just not the case. Sometimes yeah. term is better. Sometimes terms just better. You know, I think again, the big takeaway here is growing wealth for retirement tax-free mm -hmm. can be a part of your strategy, a balanced strategy. Mm -hmm. And Roth and IRAs and 401ks, Roth IRAs and 401ks are a, a, a vehicle. So are life insurance used in these ways. And if someone hears life insurance and their head kind of cocks, like, really? Then some of these things that we've talked about here, and one of the biggest takeaways is, hold on, um, if banks themselves put my money that I put in my bank, if they take that money and they put it in these kind of things, that's probably a pretty safe bet because they're regulated and they must get rate of return so that their money is optimized. So those are all wonderful things, but then is it right for you? Okay, well, I'm self-employed, so how could I use it in an advanced way? Let's talk about that. How about you know, I work for a company and I do have 401k, but I also like the sound of that. How would that affect me? And it all gets down to, let's just, See, you know, yeah. and it's there's never, in my opinion, there's never a way that goes, oh, check, set me up goodbye because, oh, we didn't realize this or you didn't tell me that aspect. And now that I've learned these things about your financial picture and where you want to go, here's what I would recommend. And I think that whether whatever we're talking about, the way that you lay things out is it might not be for you. Let's just find out yeah. because. Doesn't matter, you know, like like it matters to you because you want people to, to understand and, and make the mess, best moves forward, but you're not trying to push people in one thing versus the other. And I think that's a really wonderful position to be in. Well, Mike, I, I tell you, as a fiduciary advisor and other advisors, in my opinion, if you're a fiduciary advisor and you don't at least give your clients the opportunity to look at all asset classes, I don't think you're doing right by them. I don't think by saying, hey, I'm a fiduciary and the only thing I'm going to show you are stocks and bonds and mutual yep. funds. I don't think that's right. I don't think that you should um, discount the benefits of real estate ownership yep. and life insurance ownership and, and investing in business and maybe even investing in, in tangible things like gold and silver. Again, whatever that's what's right for that person. Yeah. So it doesn't come down to this is better than that. I, I tell folks all the time. 
They're out there for a reason. All these things, all these products are there for a reason. Why are they there? Find out how they work, find out why they're there. And then you pull them off the shelf and you implement them in your plan as needed and as it fits. 100%. Love it. Well, listen, um, I think we could keep going on and on and on and get into this strategy and that, and we don't want to get in the weeds. We want to keep right. it nice and clear and concise. And so this has been a really simple way to lay this out. And I really appreciate your approach to educating us on this. What's the best way that someone might have heard of an, an, an aspect of this or two and go, you know what, let me just uh, connect with Stamp and see what this would look like for me. What's the best way to reach out and connect with you? Sure, sure. I always say my, my websites, you know, obviously great way to catch me, lmstamper.com. Uh, but if you also Google LM Stamper, uh, that page should have everything. Now, my, not only my website, but my LinkedIn page, my Facebook page. You can see my Google reviews. Uh, you can always uh, call or text to 817 846 3005. And uh, you can just jump on my calendar, talk to stamp.com. Awesome. Well, Stamp, thanks so much for coming on. It's a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.